Good morning. So good to see you guys and sing with you. And isn't it good to see Todd Neighbors back? I tell you what, I said when I saw him earlier today, I said, now things are looking like they should look in the, on that back seat. All right. <clears throat> Well, over the next four meetings, including today, we are going to look at the sacrifice of Christ, the cross of Christ, so that the resurrection coming up soon, Resurrection Sunday, that is, uh, will have its proper context. We, we want to be people. We are people of the resurrection. But we don't want to just fast forward to the resurrection and forget the bloody cross that preceded that. And so when I say four meetings, I'm talking about today in this message, we're going to hone in on quite a few Old Testament passages showing sacrifice in God's economy that ultimately led up to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. We're going to focus on the Passover, how Christ is our Passover. Uh, next week, Byron will be preaching, and I believe he's going to take some Old Testament passages as well, but hone in on Palm Sunday. And then Wednesday, we hope you'll meet with us uh, of Holy Week because we'll meet in, at the park at Ridge Ferry and Pat is going to give us a devotion out of the life of Christ in Passion Week. And then on Friday, Good Friday, we will gather for worship and we're going to look at the seven sayings of Christ from the cross. And then we will celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. So that's what's coming This morning, as I mentioned, we're going to hone in on some Old Testament passages, particularly in Exodus chapter 12, where we will be reminded, I know I'm speaking to a well-established congregation, and nothing I think you'll hear today is, is going to be for the first time, but it's just a reminder that the cross of our Lord Jesus was not plan B. Amen. God wasn't hurrying around in heaven when Adam and Eve blew it and thinking, whoa, what, what can I do to make things right? The cross was plan A from the beginning. And I don't just mean Genesis 3.15 beginning. I mean eternity past beginning. Uh, Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 teaches us that we were chosen just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in his beloved. So when I say that the cross was not plan B, that God wasn't scurrying around looking for a, a, a Band-Aid to put on the problem, Again, I'm not just talking about in the immediate context of Genesis 3.15 and following. I'm talking about in eternity past, before you and I were created, God had already ordained that sin would come into the world and that Christ would be the Savior for all who repent and trust in this Savior. So John MacArthur puts it this way, the cross was not an alteration in God's plan the cross was God's plan. It has been said that the cross was not the end of the story, but the cross is the theme of the entire story. Would you look briefly with me in Luke? We preached through Luke two years ago. We, we finished it in uh, January of, of 2020. But uh, in chapter 24, verses 27 and 44 particularly, these verses really remind us that the Old Testament is about Jesus. It's pointing to, predicting, preparing us for the cross of Christ. If you look at verse 27 and verse 44, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Verse 44, now he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms 
must be fulfilled. Daryl Bach explains it this way. Luke's point in these verses is that Jesus is showing how the whole of Scripture fits together like a puzzle. Promises made, promises fulfilled in Christ. And how it's always been intended to be read this way. Again, pointing to, predicting, preparing us for the cross of Christ. Aren't you thankful for the unity of the Bible? And we just finished reading through the Bible in a year as a church. And we finished preaching through the Bible in a year. And I hope that you were well fed as we tried to grab hold of that scarlet th uh, th thread, cord rather, as it ran through the Old Testament all the way to Calvary. Well, again, I'm saying all of this to say that that's what we're wanting to do for the next four meetings is remind us of the cross. And so let's hone in on the Old Testament idea of sacrifice. And we're going to spend some time here. If you want to grab your Bible and be ready to look up some verses, we're going to do that rather quickly. The meaning of sacrifice has progressively been given in the Old Testament. We call this progressive revelation where things are getting clearer and clearer and clearer as we move to the New Testament. And our New Testament helps to interpret the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament itself, we see right off the bat in the story of Adam and Eve that sacrifice is necessary to cover sin. We know the story, but Adam and Eve, they didn't just fall, they jumped, as R.C. Sproul said. They jumped, and with that jump, they entered into sin, and all of their offspring would as well. And they couldn't have relationship with, they couldn't have fellowship with God in this unclean, sinful state, so they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. This was not going to to do. And so in Genesis 3:21 we see the first sacrifice made. And it was made by God himself. We're not, we're not told what the animal was, but God killed an animal and covered Adam and Eve with the animal skin. Genesis 3:21. And so right off the bat we see that sacrifice is necessary to cover sin, to atone for sin. God is holy, man is sinful, atonement must be accomplished, forgiveness must be acquired, propitiation, that is God's justice and wrath must be satisfied so that we can have relationship and fellowship with our creator. Moving along in the book of Genesis, we see in the sacrifice of Abel that sacrifice is necessary to please God. A sacrifice of death, Genesis 4, 4. Cain brought of his produce. Abel brought a blood sacrifice, and this pleased God. From Abraham in Genesis 22, we see that God will ultimately provide the sacrifice. You remember, he, he challenged Abraham to take his son, his son of promise, and to sacrifice him to the Lord. And, and Abraham was ready to do that. And, it, and with his arms stretched out and the knife coming down, God said, I have provided the sacrifice. The Passover, which we're going to hone in on in just a moment, the Passover reminds us that the sacrifice must be without spot or blemish. Exodus 12, 5, God gave clear instruction to the Israelites that this lamb that they were to have in their house for a certain period of time and grow an attachment to this lamb, it would be akin to having a pet that you have grown dear with. And now you have to sacrifice this, this lamb. This can't be the three-legged, one-eyed lamb that you were going to get rid of anyway. This had to be your very best, a spotless lamb, an unblemished lamb. And if the blood was applied over the door, that God's judgment would pass over the sinner who lived in that house. On that note, let's just turn for a moment to Exodus 12. We could read the whole chapter, but for time's sake, I want to hone in on a few verses. Exodus 12.
verse 5, we see your lamb shall be literally your 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 kid, meaning the, a, a baby lamb, or could be goat there. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. If you go down to verse 12 and 13, for I will, I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and again, and excuse me, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So progressive revelation, God is showing us some things through Adam. He's showing us through Abel. He's showing us through Abraham. He's showing us now through the Passover. Now, all of these aspects of sacrifice are meant to prepare us for Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice. We'll see in just a moment, Christ is literally called our Passover lamb. Aren't you glad when the New Testament makes a clear interpretation of something that you had a hunch, you're reading through the Old Testament, it smells a lot like Jesus, but you don't want to read too much into it, and then you get to a New Testament passage that gives commentary on that Old Testament concept or passage, and it just clearly connects it, and you don't have to guess or wonder anymore. And we're going to see that in a moment. Paul does exactly that. So that's the Old Testament. There's, there's these building blocks of God is holy, man is sinful. You cannot just strut up to God and give him a high five and say, hey, what's up? There must be sacrifice, blood sacrifice to atone, to propitiate, to forgive, or else we cannot have relationship and fellowship with holy God. And these building blocks are getting bigger and bigger and bigger until in the fullness of time, Christ came onto the scene. You remember those words in John 1 29 when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He had had these categories in his mind and he was ready for the sacrifice. When he saw Christ, he knew this is the one. So in the New Testament, obviously, it's clearer. Um, Everything in the New Testament really focuses on the cross. John MacArthur says about 30% of the text of the Gospels center around the final week of the Lord's life. Think about that. 30% of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 30% focus on one week in Jesus' life. He says the book of Acts is the record of the world's reaction to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The epistles were written to those who believe in the death and resurrection of Christ to instruct them how to live in light of the gospel. And in the book of Revelation, we meet the lamb that was slain, yet standing, who will return as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The entire Bible is about the lamb. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, from the slain animal skins used to cover Adam and Eve all the way through to Revelation, the Lamb who was standing, who is the king, who has been killed but has come back from the dead. All of the scriptures are pointing us to this unfolding plan of God. Always in the mind of God was the cross. Always. We looked at Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. You're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4 reminds us that this was the predetermined, predestined plan of God. The cross was. And it's not just about you and me. Now, we, we get the benefits. God does love us, and he chose a way to ransom us before we even sinned. But at the cross... This is the way in the wisdom of God for the full attributes, all of his glory to be seen. If there was no sin, we could not appreciate God's mercy, God's, God's uh, grace and forgiveness. We could not appreciate his anger and justice and wrath. Paul said it this way in Romans 3, God is both just and the justifier. 
And that could only be seen at the cross. So not only do these uh, progressive revelations of, of sacrifice prepare us for Christ, but just very briefly, so do the feasts that the Jews would enjoy. They had special feasts, not unlike ours. We have customs like Christmas, Thanksgiving, Good Friday, Easter. Some churches celebrate other holy days throughout the year. The Jewish people were no different. They held commemorative celebrations and festivals, which were occasions for remembering God's faithfulness to them. One such feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the Feast of Passover. In Matthew 26, 17, both of these are mentioned side by side. And really, this was an eight-day festival. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread lasted for seven days, from the 15th to the 21st. Passover was celebrated the day before on the 14th. And these two celebrations were so intertwined, so interconnected, that in the minds of the people, they were often viewed the same feast. And sometimes it was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Sometimes it was called the Feast of Passover. But they were remembering. Remember the Exodus story we just read. Don't you think that would have made a mark in your ancestors' history if, if God spoke and said, Look, I've sent out these nine plagues already. And you escape them just because you're my people. But on this one, there's some action required. You have to take an unblemished male lamb or goat and you have to sacrifice this. You have to put the blood over the door. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. Don't you think that would have been a pretty big deal when the next morning you woke up and people were mourning and lamenting because they had not in faith obeyed, and their firstborn was under God's judgment dead. So they began to celebrate this every year at the same time, to have a, a feast of unleavened bread, a feast of Passover, and remember God's goodness. Well, that brings us up to the New Testament. What weekend did Christ lay down his life? It was the Passover. He didn't just die any old day, any old way. He laid down his life. He would be adamant about that in the Gospel of John, that no one took his life. He laid it down voluntarily because he is the Passover lamb. So in 1 Corinthians 5, I told you a moment ago that we would look at this passage that, and I said, aren't you thankful when you're reading through the Old Testament and it smells a lot like Jesus, but you just want to double check yourself to make sure you're not reading into the text, eisegeting, but that you are exegeting. And so we get into 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, and he's exhorting the church. You remember this story where he is so upset with the church because they did not deal with this corrupt sinning brother and he's upset with that man for what he did a, a heinous sin no doubt but he's upset with the church because they just turned a blind eye and said well that's, that's not our problem and he's saying no you've got to deal with this the reputation the purity of the church is at stake we've been talking about this in Sunday school and not only that but sin is contagious and if you don't deal with sin, then other people are going to think it's okay for them to sin. And it's just going to spread like yeast in the dough. You got to get the, you got to get this out. And so he says in verse seven, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened for Christ, our Passover also has been sacrificed. So there it is. I mean, Paul just, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, connected the dots. Now, we were doing that, but just to have that double check, Paul says, Christ, he's our Passover, and he has been sacrificed. Let me read a couple of those passages that I mentioned to you, how it was no coincidence that Christ laid down his life on Passover weekend. 
You, I mean, if, if you've read through the New Testament, many times he would, people uh, developed a plot to kill him. And it, it just wasn't his time because he came to be our Passover lamb. He came to be the one whose blood would be applied to us so that the judgment of his father would pass over us. And he wanted this to all be connected. The Bible is so unified, a puzzle put together in Christ. John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18 is the one I was referring to. He says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I will take it up again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. And this commandment I received from my Father. Christ was not a victim. Christ is the victor. Christ was not uh, just taken against his will, so to speak, and, and killed by man's way. And on man's day, Christ said, no, no, this is the time. This is exactly the moment that I'm to lay down my life, and I will take it up again. And he did that, surely, out of love for his father. But he did that out of love for his bride, for his sheep. He came to purchase us. He came to satisfy the wrath of his father that was against us so that his father's anger would pass over us. Jewish historian Josephus said that between three and five on this day, this is when the lambs were slain on Passover. Between three and five. And this was the exact time that Christ would have been on the cross. So you think about it, Jesus' most devout followers were at the foot of the cross, not observing the traditional Passover. And that was a very big uh, holiday for them. But by now they had seen, they had connected the dots that, oh, that, those, those lambs that we sacrifice once a year at Passover, that, those are really not the Passover lambs. Christ is the Passover lamb. So they were celebrating the true Passover at the foot of the cross while Jesus was being crucified. Josephus would go on to say that there were so many lambs slain at Passover due to the population of those who had come to Jerusalem for the celebration that it literally caused a river of blood, a river of blood, he says, to run out of the back of the temple down the slope into the Kidron Valley, and it filled up a brook so deep that it ran red towards Jerusalem, excuse me, towards Bethlehem. Would you turn for just one more moment to 1 Peter? Uh, we read in Exodus how this lamb had to be spotless, unblemished, the best. And we've seen Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, connecting those dots that this is not just similar. This is spot on. Christ is our Passover lamb. And now look at Peter's language in 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19. He says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, even the blood of Christ. You say, this is all good, Pastor, but what are we doing here? Remember, four, four times over the next several weeks, we're going to hone in on the bloody cross so that on Resurrection Sunday morning, when we stand and say together, He is risen, He is risen indeed, it's placed in its proper context Absolutely, let's be people of the resurrection. Let's be people of the empty tomb. But let's appreciate what preceded the empty tomb.
when we read through our Bibles last year, you remember our time in the book of Leviticus? What a bloody book. When I think about Josephus' language of there was so much blood coming out of the temple that it ran like a river. I think about Leviticus. Blood splashed on every page. Exodus. Exodus 25 showing us the, the intricacies of the, of the temple and the, the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat where the high priest would splash the blood on the mercy seat and cover the mercy seat. Did you know that in the New Testament, the Greek word for mercy seat and propitiation are the same words? That word propitiation, that's a fancy word, but it, it means to satisfy the wrath of God. And so the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, the Septuagint, when, when you would read the, the word mercy seat, it would be the exact same Greek word that the New Testament authors used for propitiation. These two were synonymous. In other words, here's the upshot. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. He is the place where the blood was splashed, where the blood was shed, and God's wrath was turned into favor for each and every one of his people, where the wrath of God passed over us who deserved judgment, and instead we were shown favor. It's just beautiful how it connects all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Well, here are some points for application. Here's some things to ponder as we get ready to, to close. It is clear that those in the Old Testament and even those in the New Testament, particularly around the, the festivals of the Day of Atonement and the Passover, they were brought face to face with their sinfulness and God's holiness. They were constantly reminded that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And this is quoted in Hebrews 9.22, but it's a quote from Leviticus 17.11. That without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. I hope you're reminded of that today. They were, we are reminded that a spotless, innocent lamb had to die, had to atone for their sins, for God's wrath to pass over them. Jesus is our spotless, blameless Passover lamb. I hope this message helps you to love him more, to trust him more. Hebrews chapter 10 Again, giving us New Testament revelation on Old Testament information. Hebrews 10 tells it this way. I'm looking at Hebrews 10 verses 3 and, well, I think verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls or goats to take away sins. Verse 5, therefore, when he, Jesus, comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will. In other words, Jesus was showing us that he is the Passover lamb. That these other Instances were just shadows and types leading up to, pointing to, prophesying, pr predicting, preparing us for the Lamb that would take away our sins. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being perfected. Thousands upon thousands of lambs, Josephus tells us slaughtered for millions of people throughout the years. And yet all of that blood combined couldn't take away one sin. 
Jesus on the cross did what all the other lambs and goats and bulls could never do, take away our sin, remove God's wrath forever and forever. Can you say this morning that Christ is not only the Passover lamb, but he is my Passover lamb? Can you say that this morning? Can you say, oh, I, I read the information, Pastor. I see that his body was offered up for a people, for his bride, for his church. Can you say his blood was offered up for me? That his blood was shed for me? That God's justice is satisfied? That God is pleased with me because I have trusted in the final sacrifice. Can you say that this morning? At its root, Passover was God finally delivering his people from the tyranny of Egypt, from all the slavery, all the suffering that they had encountered through the Egyptians we know that's a spiritual symbol of being set free from sin, being set free from the ultimate enemy. Can you say this morning, I was once in bondage to sin, to self, to Satan, but I have been set free. I've been set free by my Passover lamb, Jesus the Christ. Of course, this all happens when we repent of our sins and put our belief, our trust, our hope in Christ alone for salvation and for the forgiveness of sins. One of the songs that I loved sharing with my mother down the stretch, um, I would sing with her. And those are some sweet times. And when she was still lucid, she at least pretended to enjoy those songs. Last few days, you know, she couldn't respond back, so she, she may have wanted me to be quiet, but she, could, she didn't tell me that. And one of the ones that I would sing most boldly and clearly to her, and she seemed to really light up when I sang it, was, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see the fountain in his day. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. I don't want you, church, just to hear this as information I don't want you just to become smarter and see that the Old Testament and the New Testament fit together like a glove in a hand. I don't want you just to be able and equipped to debate people and win those debates because you're coming to have a biblical theology. I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know that your sins are forgiven. It is well with your soul that if today is the day that God calls you to eternity, that you are ready and you are at peace, that the Father's wrath has passed over you because the blood of Christ has been applied to your heart. And I don't care who you are or how long you've been a member of this church or how young you are or how old you are. It makes no difference. I'm, I'm humbly, politely asking you to consider this now, to take inventory of this now. We're getting ready, of course, to hone in on Good Friday and then Resurrection Sunday. And I want you to be able to worship the Lord truly for what he has done for you and for who he is. A last application would be, let's read our Bibles, all of it, to see and savor Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain for God's people so that the justice of God might pass over those who are under his blood. Let's read our whole Bibles to see and savor Jesus Christ.
So in closing, absolutely, I want us to be a church that when we say he is risen, the other half says he is risen indeed. I want us to celebrate that empty tomb. But before we do, let's reflect on what we've heard today. Let's listen attentive, attentively at what Byron will preach next week. Let's gather Wednesday and hear what Pat will say about our Lord's final week before the cross. If you can join us on Good Friday, come. Let's, let's ponder those seven sayings of Christ from the cross. And then on Resurrection Sunday morning, let's blow the top off of this place. The, the roof's already in need of some TLC. Uh, it literally is. Maybe that would, would fit under some insurance claim that the, the roof was blown off as this church celebrated the empty tomb because we contemplated the bloody cross. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we can say it is indeed possible for man to know that he knows, that he knows, that he knows that it is well with his soul. It is possible in fact, it is, it is your desire that we all live in confidence that we are blood-bought, washed in the fountain, cleansed sons and daughters of God, not fearing death, not living in dread or anxiety of what's coming next. And I hope and pray that everyone who heard this message is either right now rejoicing over the, the sweet, precious blood that was shed for them, rejoicing over the fact that it is well with their soul, or today has been the day where they laid aside all of the, the church lingo and all of the props and all of their reputation of what people think, and they have come humbly, without strings attached, they have come beneath the, the precious fountain filled with blood. And they've come to be cleansed and forgiven. Oh, Lord, what a day that would be. So either way, whether you're encouraging your people or whether you've just saved some, some brand new folks. We trust that you'll get the glory that you deserve. Because after all, that's what the cross is really about, the full glory of God on display. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our Passover lamb. Thank you that the Father's wrath has passed over me and all who have trusted Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.